Let's thank God for bringing us back in our routine. Father, we thank you. Bless you. For bringing us back to class, World War College. We appreciate you, Lord. We appreciate you, Lord. Just that you teach us, oh God. You are the divine teacher. Help us, oh God. Teach us. Arm us. Arm us, oh God. With the word that we need. For your word is the weapon of war. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Today we're going to look at the Passover meal, which we call Holy Communion. It's also called the Holy Communion. So the title of this teaching is Using the Covenant of the Passover Meal in Warfare. Because a covenant meal, say, using the covenant of the Passover meal in warfare. People don't know, but it's a, it's a weapon of war. It's not just something that we eat and we look pious, you know, and they, you know, it's, it's a weapon of war that we use. Uh, and, some, and some people know it. You find that some churches, I know a church, they take the communion, they take Holy Communion. On a particular day, it's a Pentecostal church. Some churches take it every day, but they don't know what they're doing most of the time. They just think they're going to church. It's not like that. You are doing more than that. And we're going to look at that today. Amen. Amen. That's Paul was that that's what Paul was saying. That you have to take the uh, the uh, the flesh of the Lord with discernment. Discernment is knowing the spiritual uh, backing of the physical thing you are doing. That's what discernment. You must discern what you are doing. You must know what you are doing. What does it mean in the spirit? So that you can benefit from it. Amen. Amen. The Lord's Supper or Holy Communion is the New Testament term for the Passover meal. In the New Testament, they call it the Lord's Supper, or they call it breaking bread. In the Acts of Acts of the Apostles, they talk about breaking bread. They went from house to house, breaking bread every day. But the, in the church, it's not in the Bible, but we call it Holy Communion in the church. <laughs> but it's all talking about the Passover meal. And it's a, it's a meal that was taken by the children of Israel, uh, let me see now, about 4,000 years ago, on the night that they were going to come out of Egypt the next day. It's such a powerful tool in the hands of a prayer warrior. It's a powerful tool when you take it with understanding. It's a powerful tool in the hands of a prayer warrior because it's a covenant meal and what it does is to seal and renew our covenant with the Lord Jesus whenever we take the meal. Now the Lord is the captain of our salvation whom we follow into the war. You see? So it's important to take the Passover meal. We're going to look at all that it does later the benefits and all that. Without him, we dare not go into any battle or hope to win any war. And our God, his Father, the Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the man of war who never loses at any battle front. front. He never loses a battle at any battle front. And he's a covenant-keeping God. That's why his name, Jehovah, Yahweh, means that's how he introduced himself to Moses because he wanted to enter into the a covenant with the children of Israel so that he can bring them out of out of Egypt 430 years of bondage now everything that God does with man depends on the covenant he has with that person and it's an individual thing there's a global um, covenant he has with us when we give our lives to Christ we become members of his household 
so there is a covenant the covenant of father son the covenant of uh, father son is there but you see as you begin to move and grow in him you know as i told us before you will become a disciple not just a son you will become a follower of christ then you become a disciple from a disciple you become his servant from being his servant you become his friend from being his friend you become a bride of christ those are the ones that you can say i can avenge all disobedience because my obedience is complete amen. Amen. amen and so by that time you now have then all of us you also have this relationship with us which is mentioned in hosea 2 from like 16. he has a covenant of being our husband whether you are a male or a female it's a covenant that has to do with being our adonai Adonai talks about him being our master, our lord, our our uh, husband. Now, that in itself, as you know, is a covenant relationship. And that covenant relationship covers us. But not many people can access it. Because you can only access it when your obedience is, com- is fulfilled. Because when you read that uh, that passage, it, it says that by the time you have entered into that fully into that covenant, the heavens will hear you, the earth will answer to you. You will now be called Jezreel. That is the planting of the Lord. Amen. One of the ways that we keep renewing our covenant with the Lord is by taking the Passover meal. Amen. Now, the Holy Spirit, as we keep saying, is the master strategic, uh, master strategist of spiritual warfare. And he's in charge of all the angels. He's the one that gives us the strategy and the weapons of war. He's the one that reminds us of the weapons of war, of what to do. And therefore, we need to actually have Keep that covenant with the three of them. The three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because we need their utmost cooperation in the battles of life. Amen. Amen. Um, Exodus 15, 3 and 4. Tells us the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host. As it cast into the sea. His chosen captains are drowned in the Red Sea. God did that because he had a covenant. They've taken the Passover meal a few weeks, be- uh, a few days before. And this is at the other side of the Red Sea. Remember? They now suddenly know that ah, the Lord is a man of war. Moses told us that uh, this Lord, he called himself I am, I am that I am, okay, which means Yahweh. Yes, he told him us, he's the one that sent him to us, uh, to us, to, and that he's going to go to Pharaoh to bring him, to bring us out of Egypt. What they didn't know was that he was going to bring them out by war. <laughs> In fact, he himself said it. I brought it out. I brought you out by a stretched out arm. By strong hand and a stretched out arm. And he fought that war in the heavenlies, on earth, and in the waters. And he brought them out. And finally, he used the Red Sea to drown those that say he cannot bring them out. So at the, at the other side of the Red Sea was when Moses sang this song and said, Ah! The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. That is L-O-R-D in capitals, which means Yahweh. Amen. Amen. Now first, let's understand what a covenant is. What is a covenant? What is a covenant? A covenant 
a covenant is a spiritually and physically binding agreement between two parties. We can't say two people. Sometimes it's two, a family and a family. But in this case, we're talking about God and man. It can be between other gods with small g, other deities, idols, and man. They coerce man into covenants. They made strange secret covenants with you. But our God makes an open covenant with us. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me repeat it. A covenant is a spiritually and physically binding agreement between two parties. In this case, between God and man. Between God and man. Now, any covenant must have four parameters to be truly binding. Amen? Amen. Every covenant, any covenant must have these four parameters to be, for it to be truly binding. Number one, the two parties involved in the covenant. The two parties involved in the covenant. Now, this would usually be two friends like David and Jonathan or two families. The one of David and Jonathan eventually involved their families because David continued to do good to Jonathan's family even after Jonathan had died. It could be between a clan or another clan they can say, we are farmers, you are, uh, you are soldiers, let us enter into a covenant. All right? That's between two plants. That you will defend us on our farms. And we will make sure you always have food. That happens as well. Or a covenant can be between a deity and man in this case we are talking about Jehovah God and we his children now a covenant is usually entered into for the benefit and protection of the weaker party a covenant is usually entered into for the benefit and protection of the weaker party. And we know this because in Hebrews 7 7, Hebrews 7 7, it says, And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Without all contradiction, the less. That is the weaker is blessed of the better. That's the greater one. In the case of God and man, the covenant is usually initiated by God. Because he wants to tie his hands and make sure that no matter what, he will always defend you. He wants to tie his hands. He himself wants to tie his hands by the covenant passages. Because he will give you more promises than what he expects of you. He will give you more promises. He says, okay, what do you want? Uh, you, ask, you sent me on a missionary journey. I want to enter into a covenant with you. Okay, what do you want me to do for you? And you'll be telling him, I'm bringing up passages from the from the uh, from the Bible usually you know that okay I'll go on a fast and during that fast he himself will now start giving you passages from the Bible you see okay I'll do this for you is that all you want 
okay i'll do more i'll do this i'll do that and you'll find that so long as you keep to your own promises he will keep to his own even when you don't keep to your own promises he will draw you back and remind you amen so those are the two parties and how they relate to each other they say in the in psalm in one of the psalms he said even if your children was promising david because of the promise because david is a faithful man faithful to his promises and the covenants with god he said even if your children even if your children uh deny me i will not deny them i will flagellate them with the with the whip i will punish them but my faithfulness i will not take from them he said my covenant will i not break nor alter alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth you know that passage that is how covenant works with god amen hallelujah mm -hmm. now um the second parameter the second parameter is the covenant terms oh and this is why israel israel as till today is god's favorite and he called them his first son till today a tiny nation we used to go from one end to the other in one day in a bus you can't go from here to the to nigeria i mean to the top of nigeria in one day it will take you like to get to abuja is like 18 hours but in it, when we come when we arrive in the morning in uh, the southern part of israel to get to the north by six we're there it's a tiny nation narrow and it's surrounded by arabs and they have not been able to crush them <laughs> since they became a nation 74 years ago they have not been able to crush them in fact egypt had to say look i'm not following you to fight this people again the time of sadat i think they reminded him that look these are in the 80s these are the same people who your forefathers their god drowned a whole army in the sea that red sea you better don't follow the don't follow the other arabs to be fighting them so sadat said i'm not fighting them again and for that they assassinated him yes the egyptians were angry they said no we must kill israel look at that uh, <laughs> that upstarts that president that came and in iran and said his whole his whole goal is to make sure israel does not exist this was like a decade ago about 10 years ago that israel no longer exists on the surface of this earth where is he today he's gone and israel is still there hallelujah <laughs> Now, number two parameter, and that is because of the covenant. It's a covenant, nothing else. Because they've been unfaithful to God, He will punish them, but He will still draw them back and fight for them. He will say, for the sake of my name. For the sake of my name. Now, number two. The second parameter. There must be covenant terms. Oaths. It's called oaths or promises. Covenant terms, oaths, or promises. Now, the two parties will make promises to each other. And these will form the terms of the agreement. Amen? Now, in our relationship with God, the Bible contains all the terms of our covenant relationship with Him. But as I said, it's not automatic. It depends on how well you keep we keep our own terms of the covenant and god goes into um apart from the global main covenant we entered into when we gave our lives to christ you can enter into covenant with him for certain things that he wants you to do so long as it's what he wants you to do, you can enter into a covenant with him. Because as I said, <laughs> covenant always starts with from God. So if it enters into your heart to even enter a covenant with him, be sure that he's the one that wants you to enter into a covenant with him. 
the back of my Bible, that's the other one that I don't like people to take, is full of covenant passages that I wrote that God entered into with me for various assignments that he sent me. And he has been faithful completely, has been totally faithful. We learned this before we started going on on, uh, on missionary journeys in 1993. We learned it from uh, Dr. Rebecca Brown's books that you can enter into covenant with God. Lord, we want children. We want to enter into a covenant with you and say, these children will serve you. We are having them just like Hannah. I'm having these children just for you. Just to make sure that they are among those that will prepare a people for the second coming of Christ. That's why I want these children. Not because I want to be called a mother, not because I want to be called a father, but because I know, like, like Hannah, he said, I heard that you need a prophet. She heard that God needs a prophet. He said, I will give you a prophet if you give me a child. He, she asked for only one. And she said, I will give him to you. She didn't even hope to have any more. He said, I will give him to you all his days of his life. And God was watching. She immediately became pregnant. She entered into a covenant with God. And God could not say no. And we all know that that prayer did not come from her. Nobody makes such a promise. Human beings are selfish. But you have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He will talk to you. So, when he was four years old, she brought the, she brought the child to, the, to God, to Eli. At a time when she was not even sure she would have another. And God gave her five more. That is covenant. That's what covenant does for you. Amen. Amen. So when you enter into this, uh, uh, I can't say smaller, into this uh, other covenant with God for particular assignments, He is the one that will be ginger, will ginger your heart and say, "Go and read that part. Go and read that part. Go and read that part." You see, and those are his covenant. Those are his. But you have to go on a fast. Then he will talk to you, take you to this passage of scripture, take you to that passage of scripture, and then you hold on to it throughout. Amen. Those are the terms or promises. So the Bible contains all the terms or promises for a covenant relationship with God. But he can give you some of them in groups for different other covenants this is what i am saying now the word testament simply means covenant amen, amen. new testament old Co testament old testament new testament now the first part is called old testament because it happened a long time ago and because we have a new testament not because it has grown old and it has been discarded, as some people like to say. No. And Jesus Christ knew that they would say things like that. He knew he has come to make a new covenant with us, a new testament. So in Matthew 5, 17, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and or the prophets. That is what you call the, that's another way of calling the Old Testament. He said, I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You will never know how many Christian groups have said, oh, the Old Testament is gone. No, it's not gone. It's just as important as the New Testament. Because it actually explains the New Testament. The New Testament is shorter. But the Old Testament has told us most of what we need to know. And the New Testament is just explaining it to us explaining some of the things that have been said in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. Now, number three parameter, number three parameter is witnesses to the covenant right or covenant ceremony. Witnesses to the covenant ceremony. There must be witnesses. The Lord said out of two or three out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a, shall a thing be established. He is quoting from the Old Testament. 
So a covenant ceremony must always have at least two witnesses. One on this side, one on the other side. But usually there are more. They must be able to testify later that they were present and they had the promises that were made. So if one tries to break the covenant, say, no, no, no. Your great grand my great grandfather told me that your great grandfather promised this people's great grandfather that you will always be with them. Those are witnesses. And I think from that you can see that covenant is always generational. It covers generations. It, co it doesn't cover only the person that comes, that is there. It is generational. It continues for generations. Now, added to the physical witnesses, there are unseen witnesses to all covenants. There are unseen witnesses to all covenants. God and his hosts, as well as the devil and his demons. They are witnesses to every covenant. By now, of course, we know that the marriage ceremony is a covenant, it's a covenant ceremony. You make promises, you have witnesses. There are people, it's between a man and a woman. There are promises, there are oaths, there are promises, covenant terms, and witnesses. The witnesses are the ones that signed the uh, marriage register and those who watched all of them can say no we were there we were there and the photographs also testify in our modern times and of course your marriage uh, your marriage certificate is a written it's a, it's a written witness or maybe we call it a token okay we're coming to token now Number four parameter are the covenant tokens. The covenant tokens. A token is an outward sign of a hidden spiritual reality. A token is an outward sign, a physical sign of a hidden spiritual reality reality the ring the ring the wedding ring on the third finger of the left hand of a man or a woman is a token that shows everybody that this person is married to somebody somewhere even if that person is not there it's married to somebody somewhere and marriage is a spiritual relationship. It's not just a physical relationship. What we see physically proves that there's a covenant relationship between two parties. We know that the marriage covenant is used to, um, to illustrate our relationship with Christ. So the token of Israel's covenant relationship with God was that all males must be circumcised. All males must be circumcised. That's what he told Abraham. <clears throat> and there's a little, like one or two verses when Moses came from Egypt. The minute he entered Egypt, the destroyer wanted to slay his first son because he was not circumcised. So the wife quickly circumcised him. It was as important as that. It means that there was a destroyer hovering over Egypt. But the Israelites living in Goshen were protected because they were circumcised. Now, but in our own case, God later said 
to everybody. He told them, the Israelites too. He said, the token of my covenant that I want with you is the circumcision of your heart. The circumcision of your heart. And that's what he wants with us too. The circumcision of our hearts, which is allowing the Holy Spirit to use the word of God as a surgeon's knife to cut away our carnal flesh. I'll say it again. God later said that he is not the circumcision, the outer circumcision he is looking for. He told the children of Israel. And that message comes down to us too. That that's not what God is looking for. If you like, circumcise. If you like, don't circumcise. But medically, it is better to circumcise. To be, uh, for a man to be circumcised. It has nothing to do with women. That is why God now said, look, all my, my children are males and females. I cannot say men circumcised. What I want is the circumcision of the heart. By cutting our outward carnal flesh. Carnal flesh. Circumcision of the flesh starts from the heart. We agree with God that yes, I want to tow the path of holiness. We agree with God. That's why he said circumcision of the heart. Whereas in the end is the outward cutting of the of the carnal flesh by the word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now in practical terms, let's look at it now. In practical terms, what is that covenant token the Lord is looking for from us? The outward proof of our circumcised heart. The outward proof of our circumcised heart is our Christ-like character. Bottom line. That's the, that's the shortcut. That's the, uh, I mean, putting it my, uh, just plainly. It is the Christ, it is our Christ-like character. And it shows in our utterances, in our choices, in our ways. And these are, which are the things that will mark us as true followers of Christ. Our choices. What you choose to wear as a woman. Your choices. You want to marry. Who you marry. Everybody will know whether it's God that helped you to choose this man or it's the devil. You see? But if we allow the Holy Spirit to be in charge of everything, our utterances, our choices, and everything that we do, everybody will know that this one is a Christian. We don't need to tell anybody, we just know this is a Christian. And that's what they saw in Antioch when they started calling the followers of Christ Christians. Christians means little Christ. Little Christ. Acts 11.26 Acts 11.26 You can open it. Well, I'm still saying some things. Amen. The only way to achieve Christ-like character has been described to us in Romans 12. It's the only way. It's the only way. Romans 12, 1 and 2. We'll look at this in a minute. Acts eleven twenty six. What does it say? It's the only way. It's not something you can do by yourself. That no man should boast. That yes, I made myself holy. You can't. It's not possible. It's not possible. What does it say in Acts, to, Acts 11, 26? I'm wondering that. I'm wondering that Franklin. Yes. He brought him unto Antioch. Yes. And 
it came to pass that it that it would hear that the whole year yes. himself with the church mm -hmm. and taught much people yes. and the disciples were called Christ Christians. They were called in Antioch. So that's the first place they started calling them Christians. And you see, this is achieved by the Holy Spirit. By that time, they have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Acts 2. They've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. He uses the word of God like a surgeon to cut away our carnal flesh. So that after the operation, people will only see Christ in us. They will only see Christ in us. All he's asking is that we yield to him and cooperate with him. Open Romans 12. Meanwhile, please. In Romans 12, he talks about it in another way. Romans 12, 1 and 2. The Holy Spirit also uses fire yes okay let me read it Romans 12 1 and 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God can you imagine it's begging by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice okay now the heart has accepted that I want to be like Christ when you came to Christ we accept that okay I want to follow Christ so the next thing we must do is to present, present our bodies. Have you opened it? Yes. A living sacrifice. Oh, yeah. Verse 1. A living oh. sacrifice. Holy. I beseech no. you, therefore, yes. brethren, yes. by the mercies of God, yes. that ye present yourself, your body, as living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Holy, acceptable unto, unto God, God. Your reasonable service. Okay, let's stop there. Can you see? He's beginning to talk about service. That means if you want to serve God, if you want to move from being just a follower of Christ, I mean just a son of God, to a servant. You see? He's talking to disciples here. All right? So they are following Christ, so they are disciples. But you have to move to becoming a servant. For God to trust a person to become his servant, to send him forth. You know, Jesus used to he send them forth, 12. Then after a while, he sent 70. He didn't trend everybody. Those are the disciples he could trust that will represent him. So for us to be able to do that, Verse 2. For us to be able to do that, we must present ourselves to the Holy Spirit as a living sacrifice. That means on the altar. Okay. And be not conformed to this world. Okay. But be ye transformed by the meaning of your mind. mind. Yes. That ye may prove what is that good mm -hmm. and acceptable. And perfect will of God. God. Okay, now there's a whole lot he has said there. Now <clears throat> we must not be conformed to the world. The way we do things must not be like the way the world does its own things. It must not be the way we must be ready to conform to Christianity. Christianity is a lifestyle, it's not something you do on Sundays and the day you go to church. People must know and say, hey, it's those people. They give us different names. They, call, they used to call them Creo. Creo brothers, they call those Creo people. That's Christians. Christians. Or they call them SU. That's scripture you know. They call them all manner of things. Very good. If they don't call you those names, you have not become a Christian. He said, be ye transformed. Now, transformation starts from inside by the renewing of your mind. First, our mind has to agree that we want to do things the way God said we should do it. 
Our mind has to be changed from that of the world that it is okay to rig elections. They always rig elections. That's what we do in Nigeria. We always rig elections. Do you know that is what causes trouble during elections? Is the rigging. If everybody comes and we've been, we were in Ghana for like elections took place two times. Nobody's movement is restricted. Nobody is afraid to go out. Nobody even knows that anything is going on. You'll be doing what you need to do and then you go and cast your vote. Continue doing what you need to do. The election does not disturb you in any way. But in Nigeria, they have to say no movement. Very strange. Because how then do you, And that is what restricts you from having to vote in the nearest place to your house. Because you can't even take a car to go and vote. That is why if you, if you, um, if you register, you must tell them where you are going to vote. That doesn't happen in other nations. You can register in Abuja, you are living in Abuja, and by the time the elections come, you are living in Lagos, you just go and vote in Lagos. But we can't do that here. Because people's minds are not renewed. And that is why it is difficult for Christians to survive in such a system. It is something we have to work at. We have to work at it. We have to pray. We have to be the Christian that needs to, to, to that wants to do, has to be, to be a politician in Nigeria. You have to be prepared by God over decades so that you can stand and say, no, I'm not going to rig. No, I'm not going to give money to anybody to vote for me. And you will still win the election. It is a system that we have to use prayer to, to wear down. We must wear it down with prayers. We must wear it down with prayers. Or we will never have the kind of leaders that we really long for. So the renewal of the mind. There was a prayer of me and these children used to pray every morning. Lord, overshadow the Nigerians and change our mind to righteousness. We used to pray it every morning. Maybe we need to start again. Renew our mind, change our minds to righteousness. Some people don't even find, see anything wrong with it. Some were reviling Oshima Jose, but he was not ready to pay. They are abusing Obi, eh, he never, he doesn't give shishi. You see? Because to them it's normal, it's normal. So for a Christian, your mind must be renewed. The renewal in the renewal in that process, we must learn to always prove. You see, he didn't say no. To prove something is to try it, try and try it. No. Check it here and there. Check what the scriptures say. Take counsel from uh, um Godly elders, if you are not sure, for everything you need to do, you must prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect in the sight of God. What is the will of God for this thing? What is the will of God for what I want to do? How, what does God think of what I want to do? Am I doing the right thing? You must prove it. It's not something you just guess. Proving means you ask God. You ask him over and over. He will show you. When he shows you, understand what he means by what he has shown you. If you are not sure, ask somebody. Check the Bible. What does the Bible say when somebody was in that kind of situation? I need to know. This is, this is our own this is all God is requiring of us. Can you see? In that, that mighty Bible eh, of 66 books, is ours. All we want there is ours. Or he only asks us of one thing in this covenant relationship. Has he not tried? <laughs> and even that thing that he asked us of us, 
It is the Holy Spirit that we say that, that we do it. He said, present. He said, you present your bodies. I will do the rest. He said, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What do they do to sacrifice? They burn it. They burn it. They burn the flesh. The bones are never burnt. They can't burn. Bones can never burn. So they remove them. But the bones are hot. After the fire has, after the flesh has been burnt, the fire remains in the bones. That is what you use for service. For your reasonable service. That's how you get power for your reasonable service. Reasonable to whom? Reasonable to God. The kind of the kind of service that we are acceptable to God. That's what they call reasonable service. That's the only way you get power. By burning off the flesh. And and the bones, the, the fire remains on the bones for service. Amen. Amen. God told Jeremiah, said, let me tell you, I will do something for you. You see that fire will come out of your mouth and burn all these people. That is the fire that comes out and sets every captive free, that breaks every chain. That's why some people will be binding demons from here to tomorrow. The, the demons won't answer because you don't have enough power in your fire in your bones. That is why some people will just say, hey, and the demons will run. That's why some people will just appear and the demons will run. The demons you've been binding since yesterday. It depends on the fire that you have received in your bones. Amen. Now, the, when we talk about communion, the physical tokens that we bring, we're still talking about tokens. We've talked about our own tokens, and that is a, our Christian character. Now, the physical tokens of the bread and wine that we bring to the communion table is to represent the tokens that the Lord Jesus brings. And that is his broken body and his shed blood. Amen. Amen. All we have to do is come with our circumcised heart, our brokenness to the table. In the Anglican Church, I used to I used to remember that um, when we're in the Anglican Church, the day of communion is the day you will see people looking pious. They will dress decently. They will dress uh, with moderation. And when they are going forward to receive the kidney, they will look so pious, you know. And the part of the first prayers that we pray is the prayer of repentance of for sin. You see, just in case I'm not pious enough to, to, to commune with the Lord, to dine with the Lord, they will make us say the prayer of, of, um, of repentance. And so they bring the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are his own tokens. And they mean a lot. Just that bread and wine. It's not just bread and wine. By the time we bring it and we say all those prayers and we invite the Lord to the table, it, it in the spirit becomes his body and his bread. Tokens. That this, his body has been broken for me 2,000 years ago. The blood. The blood has been shed for me 2,000 years ago. So we are reminding ourselves and we are reminding the devil. That's why the, uh, in the passage, in the passage, uh, the Corinthian passage, that uh, where, uh, where, which we use, it says, as long as we take this bread and drink this blood, we proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So once we bring the bread and the wine and we are, we are proclaiming to the devil again that look, Jesus Christ came and he crushed your head at the cross. Are you seeing why it's a powerful weapon now? We crushed, he crushed your head and gave us the victory. 
Before the Lord Jesus died on the cross, nobody could bind demons. Nobody. That's why they used to be surprised. Say, what? He talks to demons and they obey him. The Jews used to have a exorcists that cast out demons. They are the only ones. They train, they train and train. They have books. They will read and read for days. Even till today, Catholics, that's what they do, exorcists. They are reading books and books and the demon is doing all sorts of things. There's a movie we saw. The, the, the girl is a girl, Chakala girl, about 15 years. She killed so many Catholic priests before she could be delivered. You see? So by the shed blood and the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross is what gives us power over Satan. That's how we got the power. So when we bring it, we are reminding ourselves of the sacrificial death of, cross, of Jesus on the cross. You see? His crucified flesh becomes a token that he brings to the table. Our own crucified flesh. He said we must carry our cross and be crucified. Crucified carnal flesh is what we bring to the table. So we must come in brokenness. Brokenness from inside. Not that we look pious because we are taking communion. And this follows that only a truly broken Christian can benefit fully from any of the covenant terms or promises that you may choose from God's word. Any of the co all the covenant passages in the Bible is only a, chose a broken Christian that can benefit from all of them. Because you can only benefit from them because of the covenant. So having kept his part, a broken believer can be sure that God will keep his part of the covenant. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, um, there's something about the word of God. When you are reading the Bible, there are times when a scripture will stick in your, in your heart. Or he will lead you there. He will just lead you there. Once God leads you to a passage, the passage is just ringing in your heart. You must look at it. Quickly open your Bible and look at it. I remember I, I was in Abuja. I went to stay with the, um, another uh, woman of God. And she was surprised. So why is your Bible by your pillow? Even my friend, when her husband died, I went to stay with her. Ah, why is your Bible by your pillow? I said, because at any time, I can open it. At any time in the night, too, I can open it. And it's usually there with a torch, with a touch light, a torch, that I can put on the light and check what God wants to say. And once he says one thing, be sure that he's not going to say just one thing. If you wait... Or if you have a Bible, if you wait, you see, if you look at your Bible, uh, there are some Bibles that are they, are, they are called chain reference. One passage leads to the next, to the next. Yes. Your heart will start working like a chain reference Bible. It will lead you from that one to the next, to the next, to the next. Amen. Amen. Now there's something God says in Deuteronomy 29, which is very, very important. He was making a covenant with the children of Israel. And he told them, he said, this covenant I'm making with you today is not only with you that are standing here, but with all your loved ones that are not standing here. So a, a covenant with God, God is interested in families. He's not interested in only you. Because he knows that if you make a covenant with only me, and the covenant doesn't cover my children. If anything happens to them, I will be disturbed. And I will, I will go back to him. 
and start lamenting. You see? So he cuckoo will allow the covenant to cover you. And it covers children unborn. It covers everyone. Let me let me put it this way, the way God told me. He said, everyone that lives in your heart and everyone in whose heart you live. Everyone that lives in your heart, everyone in whose heart you live. Because there are people that think about you, worry about you genuinely. There are people who hate you. Your covenant will not cover them. Your covenant will not cover them. There are people that you are even doing warfare because of you may not even know that they are behind your problems. You see? You won't know that. They, that's why I said don't bother to pray against human beings. Because God, the word of God and prayer, prayer is not stupid. Prayer is not stupid. You just pray as God said you will pray. The prayer will go where it needs to go. God will direct it. Holy Spirit will direct it. He will just laugh and say, look at this girl. You don't know that the person you are praying for is the one behind your problems. And of course, that prayer will not work for him. But we leave that to God. Let God do what he needs to do. We leave God to do what he needs to do. And we won't bother ourselves. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So all we've done is the introduction. That's the first part. Uh, the first part. Uh, next week, uh, next time, we'll begin to now dissect what happened on the first Passover covenant night the first passover uh, covenant night 4000 years ago in the land of egypt that happened the day before the night before they came out of israel so we want to pray say lord today i enter into a covenant with you I enter into another covenant with you. A new covenant that covers me, my household, my children, and my generation. A covenant that covers me and all my loved ones that are not here. All those that live in my heart, all those in whose heart I live. I enter into another covenant today that I will serve you all the days of my life. That I will train my generations. I will train my generations. I will train my children. I will train my children and my generations to come. And my generations to come. They will train their children. They will train their children to serve God. To serve God. To worship only God. To worship only God. The covenant keeping God. The covenant keeping God. His name is Yahweh. His name is Yahweh. Here I am. I am that I am. I am that I am. Father. Father, you will be our father. You will be our father. You will be our God. You will be our God. And we'll be your children. We'll be your children. We'll be your people. We'll be your people. We ask you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you will grant us that, you will grant us that covenant today. That covenant today. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. The Son. The Son. And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. And that Lord. And that Lord. That covenant. That covenant. Will cause us to remain yours. Will cause us to remain yours. Our generations to be. To be, yours. Uh, to be yours no matter what happens no matter what happens. because whatever is co whatever is committed to your hand whatever is committed you are able hand. to keep you are ready to keep therefore we know Therefore, we know that you will not break this covenant. That we will not break this covenant. You will cause us, you will cause us and, our and our generations to always be your people. To always be your people. And you will always be our God. And you will always be our God. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name, Lord. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. We ask you. We ask you. To prepare us. To prepare us for this covenant. For this covenant. We lay our bodies, we lay our bodies on, the altar, on the altar that you will prepare us. That you will prepare us. 
Burn away all the flesh. Burn away all the flesh. That will not allow us. That will not allow us to keep our own part of the covenant. To keep our own part of the covenant. And let the the and let your fire remain. And let your fire remain in our bones. In our bones. For service. For service. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Let us follow you. Let us follow you. Cause us to follow you. Cause us to follow you. Cause us to hear your voice. Cause us to hear your voice. Cause us to see your footprints. Cause us to see your footprints. Give us your character. Give us your character. Teach us you are the master. Teach us you are the master. You are the rabbi. You are the rabbi. Teach us. Teach us. How you do things. How you do things. How you think. How you think. How you reason. How you reason. How you look at things. How you look at things. So that we can we can bring our Christ like character. So that we can bring our Christ like character. As a token. As a token. Of our covenant with God. As our covenant with God. So that we will never we will never let you down. So that we will never let you we down. We will never let God down. We never let God down. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Blessed be your name, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.